teacher that how is the performance of individual students regularly as in who participates and who doesn't and based on that information and in our first session we also like for, for the groups we ensured that there is a mix of people that not all the people who speak are in the same group so that there is equal participation from all the groups and they can take the piece so we did something similar in that case okay. nice nice all right so uh, i think uh, we can uh, begin our session so i am very happy to welcome professor justin rick uh, he is the assistant professor at uh, uh, mit uh, which is actually massachusetts institute of technology in the department of comparative media studies a slash writing uh, so professor uh, justin is also the director of mit teaching systems lab and this lab uh, designs implements and uh, it studies the future of teacher education uh, specifically teacher learning uh, professor justin is also an instructor for five free open licensed mooc uh, courses uh, uh, focusing on change leadership in education uh, so he also host a podcast uh, uh, titled teach labs um and before joining mit uh, uh, professor justin was a lecturer at harvard graduate school of education and he, he was also Re richard l manchel harvard x research fellow um uh, and then he conducted uh, many large scale studies uh, on open online learning through harvard x um professor justin has widely published uh, in really high impact journals uh his writings have appeared in uh, science the atlantic educational researcher the washington post and many other outlets uh and for several years he, he also blogs so uh, he he blogs at education week interestingly uh professor justin um started his career uh teaching wilderness medicine and he has also been a coach of wrestling um and a high school teacher Uh, he he taught classes on world history uh, so we are very, very fascinated uh, to have a lifelong teacher and then somebody who truly loves teaching uh, and more more specifically um, we have him here uh, because he published recently a book uh, he authored this book uh, it's titled failure to disrupt why technology alone can't transform education and it's been published uh by harvard university press uh so professor justin rick uh, we are thrilled to have you uh it's a great honor um so now the platform is yours great well it's terrific to be here um one thing that might be helpful actually is if just folks took a quick second to introduce themselves in the chat i would say the main piece of information that would be helpful for me is just why you're taking this course or what you're interested in um so if you just have a moment to um to to post something that gives me a little orientation to who you all are while I'm talking I can sort of scan through that um and then professor kathan what norms do you have about people asking questions i would welcome people to um uh to post any questions they have in the chat as well um and then also just to turn your microphone on and say hey wait a minute i want to understand something better or ask you something or anything like that. So um I I I'll tell you a funny story which is what I I did my doctorate at MIT um and at MIT you know if you have a 40 minute talk everyone listens politely through the whole talk and then sort of asks you questions at the end. Um and uh but then at MIT um the first time I gave a talk there as a graduate student someone had a question on my title slide. Um and uh i i always appreciated uh, the interest in trying to trying to jump right in and get into things so folks should feel free to um interrupt me as we're we're going along um but i'll tell you about uh this new book that i've written and then you can uh uh you can ask me questions about that uh um as we go along thanks for folks who are starting to add some of your um some of your questions here about motivation and learning and those kinds of things. Um 
So I have this book, Failure to Disrupt. You can go to failuredisrupt.com if you want to learn more about it. Um, we have a free online book club that we just started that'll run for 10 weeks that you're welcome to join. Um, failure to disrupt.com slash virtual book club. Um, and part of the framing of this book is that over the last 10 or 20 years, people have made um, really remarkable claims about how education technology um, is supposed to transform learning. Um, so we had a Harvard Business School professor, Clay Christensen, um, who said uh, that in 2009, that by 2019, 50% of all secondary school courses would be online. They would cost a third as much. They would have better learning outcomes. Um, when massive open online courses got started in, in 2012, 2013, Sebastian Thrun, who founded Udacity, but also was very involved in uh, artificial intelligence and self-driving cars, um, said, uh, you know, there'll probably only be 10 institutions of higher education left in the world and Udacity might be one of them. Um, Sal Khan had a 2011 TED talk, let's use video to reinvent education. Let's have each individual student sit in front of a terminal um, and sort of chart their own individual pathway through math learning um, with feedback and facilitation by computers. And then periodically teachers will grab all these students and once they've sort of learned the fundamentals, do interesting projects with them and those kinds of things. Um, Sugata Mitra, um, who is a TED Prize winner, who actually said, you know, in some ways went further than all of these and said, like, school isn't even necessary. We just need to give students laptops um, that are connected to the internet, and groups of students can teach themselves anything at all. Um, so these are pretty striking claims about how technology should be transforming learning like by roughly about now, you know, a lot of these claims that I'm pointing to um, from 2009, 2011, 2013. Um, so then earlier this year, as we all know, um, a pandemic strikes the globe, you know, maybe as many as 1.6 billion learners are sent home. Um, you know, and the sort of like the value proposition that these ed tech evangelists were promising was something along the lines of, we can make education technology that's better than your traditional functioning school systems. Um, all they had to do during the pandemic was replace, you know, a sort of broken hobbled system. Um, you know, in many cases they had to kind of be better than nothing. Um, and I think there's very little to me that's more striking about the pandemic um, that uh, it, is, it is not the case that in sort of education technology's moment to be a savior that it kind of came in and saved the day, but rather I think most people's experience with remote learning has been frustrating and disappointing. Um, it's also not the case that for the most part faculty have turned to novel technology solutions to address their problems. Um, so they have not, by and large, use massive open online courses or turn to adaptive tutors or um, other kinds, you know, the, the AI or virtual reality or any of those kinds of things. Um, overwhelmingly, the two most popular technologies of the pandemic have been two of our very oldest learning technologies. Um, learning management systems, which were theorized in the 60s and 70s, um, made commercial in the 90s and made open source in the 2000s. Um, and then a technology when it was first piloted in the 1930s was called video telephony, which we now refer to as video conferencing. Um, so, um, you know, again, in a moment when sort of like K-12 education, higher education is hobbled, is, is on its knees, is performing you know, extremely poorly, uh, you know, according to nearly all the metrics that we care about for education, um, it still wasn't the case that people said, oh, finally, now this sort of new generation of ed tech is here to save us. Instead, overwhelmingly what systems did was to say, how can we replicate as closely as possible existing school systems using the simplest technology we have? Like in some ways in higher education, we, had all the professors like walk away from their lecterns and just go to their home office webcams and keep teaching roughly the way that they had been teaching before. Um, 
despite the fact, you know, I mean, you can think about this very specifically in the context of a course like Introduction to Microeconomics. There must be thousands of Introduction to Microeconomics professors around the country, many of them probably not very good at all at rapidly creating online courses in the middle of a pandemic with their kids not in school and running around and things like that. By contrast, edX and Coursera and Udacity have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe more than millions of dollars building introductory microeconomics courses and virtually no one wanted them. Like they were there sort of sitting on the shelf waiting to go um, and that's not what people chose. And it's not what people chose because it's not really what faculties and universities wanted to do. It's also, I think, not what people chose because my sense is, and you would have your own sort of data from your own context, that it's not what students wanted. Um, you know, like Kevin Werbach has a really good course on gamification on Coursera. Um, and Kathan could have been like, why are you all hanging out with me? Like Professor Werbach like, has taught this course to hundreds of thousands of people and, you know, has gotten really good reviews on it and has gone through multiple iterations and like a whole budget to build this course. Like just go take his course and like come, you know, I'll grade your essays and, you know, we'll chat about it once a week or something like that. Um, but my hunch is that if he, if Kathan did that, most of you would be like, no, like Kevin Warbach's fine. He's a nice guy at Wharton or whatever. But like, we want to take a class with Professor Shukla. And we know that like, you know, he's just at home and busy. And, you know, I, I have no idea whether or not this is- you To know, be honest, I, I did take some of his classes as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the, the whole point is we, people actually don't want a lot of that. What they want is something that's pretty close. As far as I can tell, um, if you look at the way things have unfolded, um, so then the question becomes, you know, two questions that are really salient to me are, um, why is reality so far from the promises of education technology evangelists? And, you know, what would it look like for people and systems to both make better predictions about the future of technology um, and to have a better frame for thinking through how to implement technology? You know, I mean, especially things like sort of the massive open online course mania, the enthusiasm for those technologies is not a sort of zero cost um, enterprise. It's not just like an interesting thing people are talking about. You know, universities spent millions of dollars in vet, you know, they, and, and K-12 school systems periodically spend millions of dollars investing in sort of new kinds of technology trends. And a lot of times um, those investments don't lead to better learning outcomes. And in a lot of cases, they don't even lead to things that are being used. Um, so, so really the point of this book is to try to give us some better frames from saying, okay, if new technologies come along, um, how should we think about them? I, you know, I think another thing that the pandemic does is it makes sort of skepticism untenable as well. Um, there, there are lots of good reasons to say, well, you know, if, if the education technology evangelists are just sort of sending us hooey all the time, maybe we should ignore them. Um, that, you know, that I think is a legitimate perspective. But you also can't be such an ed tech skeptic right now because online learning is the only game in town. Um, and so what are the kinds of sort of stances that we might productively take towards education technology? Well, here's one um, that, I, that I think we can illustrate again with Sal Khan. Um, so millions of people have watched Sal Khan's 2011 TED Talk. Um, I think very few people have read his January 3 interview with District Administrator Magazine. So District Administrator Magazine is this like little trade journal that goes out to superintendents in the United States. Um, and in the meantime, he's created his own school. It's a private school. I think the tuition is like $25,000 a year or something like that. So it's like largely getting affluent, well-supported students to come to this school. He can hire all the teachers. He can sort of control the whole context. And, and he says in 2019, oh, actually, I, I can't even get this stuff to work the way I want it to in my school. Um, you know, it's taken me and Khan Academy a long time to really realize this, but like, Mastery-based, self-paced learning environments are really hard. They don't work very well. And in fact, what I recommend now is that instead of completely rearranging your schools using technology, um, another approach is just like to teach traditional math four days a week and then to do Khan Academy one day a week. Um, that instead of envisioning technology as a force that disrupts existing technology, existing learning systems. It sort of like rearranges the landscape of education. 
Another thing that we can think about technology is, is that existing educational systems domesticate new technologies. They take new technologies and they say, here are the places where those tech new, new technologies are most likely to fit and most likely to slot in. Like it turns out that even in Khan's own school, um, he can't completely reconfigure math instruction, but it turns out that it's kind of useful to have um, kids doing practice problems online one day a week. Um, now, one issue with this is that this very model is like not something that Sal Khan discovered. Um, so as early as the early 1990s, Ken Katinger and other folks at um, Carnegie Mellon were taking adaptive tutors, bringing them into the Pittsburgh public schools, and they figured out that like a pretty good model was to have people, te regular teachers teach four days a week and then to use computers and adaptive tools one day a week. Um, and they actually, in these early studies, get outcomes which are not that different um, from what Sal Khan comes up with, uh, you know, 25 years later, he's got models and outcomes. You know, another way that you put this is like, I think Sal Khan has gotten something like $150 million US dollars of investment over the last 10 years. And his sort of conclusion about math education is something that you could have found with a trip to the library um, in 2000, 2000, you know, 1995 or something like that. Um, which is to say, that lots of times when we're trying to answer questions about education technology, history is really useful. Um, the job of the education entrepreneur is to convince you that they have developed something that offers some kind of disjunctive break with the past. Um, there really are not examples of new technologies that lead to disjunctive breaks of the past, um, that lead to like sweeping new approaches to learning. Um, mostly what we have is a series of like iterative incremental improvements in the system that build on, um, on technologies, on pedagogies, on implementation approaches that we already have. Um, so one, one set of ideas that can help you navigate these conversations is to think about the stances that people bring when they talk about learning technologies. Um, for education technology evangelists, they tend to have what my colleague Morgan Ames calls a charismatic stance. They, they claim that technology disrupts and transforms existing systems and that futures will be new and different because of technologies and the technologies will be driving those changes. There will be a certain inevitability of changes that's behind those technologies. This is sort of like Sal Khan circa 2011. Um, Sal Khan circa 2019 has what we might call a tinkering stance, which Morgan Ames draws from the work of David Tyack and Larry Cuban. Um, and one way to think about this is to assume that new technologies will be uh, domesticated by existing systems and that the future is really an extension of trends from history, um, that we can look back into the past, see how technologies have worked before, um, and on the basis of how technologies have worked before, make good guesses about how they work in the future, just like you know, in 2012, we could have looked at the kinds of adaptive tutors and video lessons that Sal Khan was building for math and say, oh, in the 1990s, we started working on that. We have a bunch of research on that. We can actually give you some answers um, about whether or not this is going to lead to a disjunctive break or, or things that we can predict reasonably well. Um, <clears throat> so one way that I try to help people look back into that history um, is to say, we can classify lots of kinds of education technologies into a few different buckets. So I'm particularly interested in technologies that we could call learning at scale. So learning environments that support many, many learners and few experts to guide them. Um, I am particularly interested in these tools because education technology evangelists are particularly interested in these tools. Um, calculators are not necessarily tools for learning at scale. Um, they don't, they aren't like a self-contained learning apparatus um, and, and education and technology evangelists have not promised that calculators are going to radically reconfigure how education works. Um, but there's a set of tools, particularly around learning at scale, um, in which there are often claims that the future of learning can be dramatically different from the past. Um, the way I organize these things into genres is to ask the question like, who's responsible for guiding the sequence of learning activities? Who selects the order in which a learner can choose to move through an environment? 
Um, and I would say that there's basically three answers to that question. There are instructor guided things like massive open online courses. There are algorithm guided things like adaptive tutors. And there are peer guided things like um, network learning communities, like the scratch programming community, other kinds of things like that. Um, if you can recognize these three genres, you can almost always take something that's being presented as new and to slot it into one of these three genres. And each of these three genres has pedagogies that they're most closely associated, has technologies that they're most closely associated with, has a track record of research and implementation. You can kind of take new things and be like, you know, it's probably gonna kind of fit into um, one of these three buckets. So for instance, um, there's lots of different research that's out there, lots of different approaches to thinking about pedagogy. Um, but, but, you know, overwhelmingly, or maybe to a first approximation, there are really two ideas about pedagogy. Um, one idea is that the best way for people to learn is for experts to transmit their knowledge to novices. Um, in the United States, uh, there, was a, there was a psychologist named Edward Thorndike who was a sort of champion of that model in the early 20th century. Um, and then there's another pedagogical model which says that um, the best way for people to learn is for them to authentically experience some kind of new phenomenon um, as an apprentice in the context of peers or in the context of other learners. Um, a lot of work in gamification falls more into the Thorndike bucket of thing. There's something like, there's a bunch of stuff that we need people to learn. And a problem is that they're not motivated. Um, so, you know, like basically like they don't put their buckets under the spigot enough, you know, like the experts have the spigots that are, that are falling out and the learners have their buckets. But the problem is they keep taking those buckets and wandering away and playing Xbox with them or other kinds of things like that. So how can we gamify them? So like, it's really fun for them to take their buckets and put it under the hose. Um, and we can like measure which of those techniques work and which of those techniques don't work and so forth. You know, there's certainly gamified approaches to apprenticeship and things like that. But a lot of gamification as it's practiced is basically like trying to make direct instruction more palatable to learners. Um, you know, so it turns out that these different pedagogical philosophies are pretty closely associated with these different technology genres. So most instructor guided learning at scale, most MOOCs and other kinds of things like that have a sort of Thorndike direct instruction approach. Um, they also are typically not, um, you know, uh, like remarkable features of technological wizardry. For the most part, they're implementations of technologies we have for a while. You know, a MOOC is basically a learning management system, like whatever you're using in this class, Canvas or Desire to Learn or whatever I am invented, um, with some auto graders on top of it. You know, things that sort of can like in some limited way, check your understanding and give you feedback and award you credit for doing things or not. Um, algorithm guided learning at scale also tends to have these sort of direct instruction pedagogical proclivities. They also have auto graders, um, but they also need some, some algorithm to operate to adaptively assign you things. Um, and typically that's, you know, that's, Actually, this is a field in which people will claim that they have these like brand new cutting edge algorithms that are, you know, powerfully understanding who you are and what you need to know and things like that. And if you like lift up under the hood, a lot of them are powered by item response theory, which again was like developed by educational testing services in the 1980s. Um, and like, you know, maybe there's some more sort of fancy pieces that we're putting on top of these things. Um, but but it's but but like you can understand if you've never studied item response theory before, you can read chapter two of my book and in like 10 pages have a basic understanding of how it works um, an understanding sufficient enough to be able to um, make some guesses about how a new technology will perform an environment. Um, we've had adaptive tutors for a long time. We have like a pretty long research base around them. I mean, in some ways, since the earliest days of computing we've been trying to do something like a computer-based tutor. You know, in the, in the late 1960s, when we had computers the size of rooms, um, computer scientists and instructional designers were partnering to try to build these tools. So there's 60 years of research to look with here. Like we kind of know these things, they work a little bit in math, they seem to not work as well in reading, they have some applications in language development, there's some new things evolving in computer science. Um, they tend to work okay when there's, when, when correct answers in a field can be very discreetly designed when the answer is um, yes or four 
or A, um, or a, a computer program that meets a certain engineering criteria, they tend to not be useful at all when we're trying to help people learn to reason from evidence. Um, they don't evaluate human writing or human argumentation very well, which is like kind of a problem because that's actually the main thing that we teach um, in a liberal arts education. Um, and then there's this sort of third bucket of tools um, which are peer guided learning environments, which by contrast to the other two tend to be built more often by people who have more an affinity um, for project based learning for apprenticeship for progressive approaches to education. Um, but they all tend to have some similar technological features as well. They need to connect people on the web in some way, and they need aggregators or hashtags or other kinds of tools that help communities find each other and link with one another. Um, they tend to work really well for people with high intrinsic interest and motivation in things. Um, when people are really fired up to learn something, and you all probably know this from your own experience, like I suspect many of you are avid consumers or participants in networks that you know do makeup tutorials or hairstyling or how to beat levels in a video game or how to do some handicraft or project that you're interested in or cooking or recipes or something like that. Um, and you probably learn stuff like that without any difficulty at all online because um, you have all kinds of folks um, that are there supporting you know, high, high level of interest and motivation. And then you take those sort of same set of skills and you try to apply them to learning calculus through an online course or through an online community um, or something like that. Um, and uh, you probably find that much, much harder. Um, and if you're like most people, you're not particularly successful at it um, because it's really hard. It turns out that you know, in the absence of a lot of motivation, it's hard to do online schooling in contrast to online learning. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, the, the reason to create this sort of tripart system is to say, you know, the next time someone presents you with a technology that they claim is going to radically reconfigure the way education is delivered and dramatically improve student learning, um, see whether or not you think it might fit into one of these three buckets. And if it does, you can probably make some good guesses about how it's most likely to fit. The other thing is if you understand the history of these tools um, and these different approaches and services, then you can say, okay, what is actually new about this um, you know, new entrant that we're talking about here? Is there, is there something here that's like particularly distinctive because that's what we then need to focus on. Um, uh, you know, I just was reading something I put in the conclusion of the book is as I was finishing it, um, the people who run the Canvas learning management system said, we're really excited about data science because we have all of this data that's being generated across all of our learning management systems. And I think we're really going to be able to figure out some exciting new ways to support learners. Um, and as soon as I read that, you know, in 2019, I said, like, that's exactly what people said about massive open online courses. Um, and in, in, in the seven years in between, tens of millions of people have signed up for these courses. Some of the very brightest computer scientists and learning scientists from all over the world, um, from Harvard and Stanford and Xinhua and TU Delft and uh, Sciences Po, all of these places around the world um, have had very smart people studying the, re the terabytes and terabytes of data that come out of MOOCs, and they, for the most part, have not discovered anything interesting about learning. Um, so what canvas do you have that's somehow different from what all of these MOOC providers have? Um, like, like, if, like if they have not been successful, um, why will you be like, what is particular about the data that you're collecting, the system that you have, your integration with partners, those kinds of things that would have us believe that there's some kind of different future here. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes there are answers to those questions. Sometimes things are different, but they're usually not very different. Um, there's usually like some particular piece, some particular tweak, um, some small piece to advance. It's usually incremental and stepwise. Um, rather than really transformative. And, you know, and one of the most common retorts from folks who are sort of aligned with this charismatic view is that, well, there just hasn't been enough time. Um, you know, originally we said two years was enough time, but now it looks like seven years is not enough time, but like give us another 10 or 20. I, one of the things that I quote in the conclusion of the book is that in, in about 1913, um, Thomas Edison said that it would take about 10 years for film to replace textbooks. 
We would no longer have print textbooks. We would just be watching videos. He wouldn't call them videos. He would call them film strips. Um, and then in 1923, he gives another talk where he says, in 20 years, um, video will entirely replace print textbooks um, or, the, or the printed word in work. So like he gave himself 10 years when that wasn't enough. He gave himself 20 years. That's the kind of argument that you'll hear, uh, um, I think, repeatedly in, in these themes as well. Um, I had some reason for showing that slide again, but now I don't remember. All right. So, no, so in the second half of the book, the challenge that I try to wrestle with is given this history of incremental improvement, how would we make the most possible progress on this incremental improvement? What are the best, what's the best sort of tinkering stance to take towards new technologies so that they can be used to improve teaching and learning? Um, and I think there are three features of the education system and its interactions with technology that are really important to think about in technology implementation. And that the first is that educational systems- because I have a question if I may. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, I had a question about the previous part and that is why I wanted to ask right now. Uh, so yeah. what I was saying is that, uh, what are these metrics that we are using to reject the hypothesis that, well, um, large scale technological interventions would not work? Sure, so I think the, the metrics are different in different fields, um, but there are some areas in which there's quite a bit of consistency. Um, so for instance, uh, adaptive tutors are often deployed to improve the core curriculum in schools. Um, and you know, in United States schools, we are particularly interested in reading comprehension and mathematics um, for a variety of reasonable and historical reasons. Um, and so we've developed in the United States a set of systems that measure student proficiency in those two domains. Um, and we have 20 or 30 years of studies about how adaptive tutors improve reading and math. Um, and we can actually take all those studies and we can sort of put them together into meta-analyses um, and say, um, you know, what what impact do these tools have when they're implemented? Implemented, And the answer consistently in study after study is actually not that much. Um, there's actually you know, very little evidence that adaptive tutors to improve reading comprehension work on average at all. Um, and then there's a little bit more evidence that under certain kinds of circumstances, um, we can develop math tutors that help, but not in a kind of like completely transformative oh my gosh, look, our ninth graders are learning calculus kind of way, or we've closed the achievement gap between more and less affluent students. Um, we tend to look at these studies and be like, oh, that's like a nice little, you know, modest blip of improvement, you know, in sort of the best of cases. Um, in, uh, you know, some of this is a little bit harder in higher education because we basically don't measure learning in higher education, um, but we can ask questions like, um, I mean, some of it we can use the metrics of the um, of the of the advocates of adoption themselves and say, look, you know, one of the ways that we would know these things are working is if they're used a whole lot. Um, you know, there was a, there was a claim for massive open online courses that they were going to create new pathways into higher education for people who couldn't afford or didn't have access to um, higher education and. Overwhelmingly, that has not happened. I mean, there are like particular niches, particular places maybe where you could find things that look like that. But then when you do a scan of all of the people that are signing up for massive open online courses, particularly for massive open online courses that have some kind of like credit or degree associated with them, overwhelmingly, they're already affluent, already educated people pursuing their second or third master's degree. So we can sort of take the, you know, we can, we can take the ed tech evangelists at their word um, and say, okay, this is what you told us that you were trying to accomplish. Let's see if we can come up with measures of the progress that you've made towards those goals. And what you read, you know, if you get the book sort of throughout is, you know, in, in a lot of cases, um, you know, basically in all the cases, these technologies sort of don't live up to their grandest hype. Um, instead, when they do work, they work in particular places for particular people in particular contexts. Um, that they are not disruptive or transformative, but in the best cases, they're like particular tools that work for particular people in particular places. Um, and, you know, I mean, part of what I argue too is that 
that's basically as good as it gets. Um, and so instead of trying to develop market hype technologies sort of underneath this rubric of disruption and transformation, let's have conversations about education technology, which start from the point that they'll you know, only enable incremental improvement. Other, other questions while I'm here on part one? That was a good one. So, but then what um, are there consumer side, um, I don't know, surveys or information that explain this process, explain why these have not worked. And then if I look at a platform, which is, uh, which is claiming that it will completely replicate our offline experience into the online world, then how do I reject it? Or how do we examine that? Good. So, so if a, so if a platform claims that it can replace um, another uh, another you know on campus learning experience, I mean, the, you know, one of the problems with assessing these tools is education is immensely complex. Um, the field of what we want people to learn is just incredibly different. So, for every technology, you might say like, well, you know, Duolingo is a language learning technology which claims that it can provide people with an introductory learning experience in language acquisition. Um, and then in some cases it can replace or complement um, introductory language instruction in um, particularly in higher education. Um, so we would want to, to some extent to evaluate Duolingo on those claims. Like it says it will do this. Um, and you could certainly use um, consumer surveys as one tool to evaluate that. You could use um, adoption patterns as one tool to evaluate that. There are also cases in which we like know how to measure language acquisition. Um, we can also just like look at what Duolingo does um, and what kinds of learning experiences it offers in the context of everything that learning languages requires. Um, and you know, there's there's much more evidence that it helps people in the first initial stages of language acquisition than it does in later stages of language acquisition. So sometimes we make this distinction um, between learning to read and reading to learn. Um, that these kinds of online tools are actually like have some things that they do well in terms of learning to read. Um, like you can learn some vocabulary, you can learn some conjugations, you can say some initial sentences. Um, and there are assessment tools that are designed within Duolingo that evaluate whether or not you're doing well at those kinds of things. And we can do things like we can run randomized controlled trials. We can assign half of people to um, study introductory language through Duolingo, and we can have half of people study language through their you know, regular Spanish program in their local school or their English program in their local school and see how people are doing. We can also just observe that Duolingo doesn't have assign, you know, assessment tools or that many learning resources that test deeper levels of fluency. Um, so like you can't talk to a bot in Duolingo and have you, ask you questions about Cervantes, Don Quixote and about the sort of key themes that arrive in that work. And it can't give you any feedback about that. That would be exactly the kind of thing that you would do in like a year two, year three Spanish class. It would be sort of the core of that class. Um, and there's, you know, not much in language learning apps that even attempts to replicate that kind of uh, interaction. So almost, uh, you know, like on, you know, just on a sort of first order basis, like what does this thing even try to do? We can identify some things that it, that it doesn't do very well um, and, uh, um, and evaluate it on that. So, you know, I, that the, the complexity, you know, and I just like walked through a whole example that was just based on evaluating language learning. And we would have to do something similar if we wanted to evaluate, you know, massive open online courses that claim to teach about supply chain management or, um, you know, peer networks that teach people how to um, apply makeup in new and creative ways or to the, the you know, computer programs. And people have disagreements about what kinds of measures we should use. Um, a lot of the people who are interested in peer learning, they are particularly interested in evidence that some individual practitioners become proficient in a new domain. Um, so like, Scratch cares, you know, the Scratch community cares a lot about the small number of people um, 
who get really excited about Scratch and really dive into it. And they don't worry that much about the people who quit. Um, because if your whole theory of learning is one that's driven by individual autonomy and by the choice to join a learning community and by your own intrinsic motivation, then someone who drops out of something because they're bored and goes and does something else that's better, like that's a great thing. That's someone sort of expressing their agency. Now, inside a school system, that ideology doesn't necessarily work as well. Like if you're assigned into a gamification class and you're like, actually, I don't care about this anymore. I'm going to go do something else. Like then you have to be failed and, and other kinds of things like that. Um, and so, um, you know, other, uh, you know, many other education technology developers uh, use a whole different set of outcomes to be able to evaluate um, uh, whether or not something is working. But, but there, but there, you know, my, my, my sense is like, I don't know, when I go back and forth with people who claim that there are particular tools or particular like examples of really transformative new things, um, I find that they are often, um, you know, sort of, they, they're still better framed as interesting niches, as like particular parts of the education system not part of a transformative whole. So for instance, um, you know, probably the program that is like most fulfilled the vision of MOOC-based learning um, is the um, online masters of computer science at Georgia Tech, which has 7,000 people enrolled in it at any given time, um, you know, and, and it, you know, it's by far, by orders of magnitude, the largest MOOC-based graduate program in the world. Um, it was like one program that happened to work and seems to have actually taken up like quite a bit of the market share for that thing because there aren't 10 other successful MOOC based um, computer science masters. There also are not successful, um, you know, MOOC based nursing programs or MOOC based account. You know, there's like no other program of the size of that one program. Like one group sort of got it right, found a particular niche, but it's not like a harbinger of a whole series of changes that are about to unfold in our education system. Um, it's just like an interesting first mover that found a moderately large niche to occupy. Um, <coughs> so there's a couple other questions that are in here. Uh, Ashutosh asks, most apps need to communicate in some language um, as they can't use nonverbal communication aids. How do we solve for that problem? Um, you know, I mean, the way I would think about that question is um, what are, how do we use computers to do the kinds of things that they are good at? And then how do we be realistic about the kinds of things that they're not good at and make sure that we still have really capable humans um, doing the things that computers are not good at? Um, and so, um, you know, yeah, com computers are, com computers are a huge part of teaching and learning. Um, is providing some form of pastoral care, um, is encouraging people, making them feel welcome in the community, making them feel like they belong, building their confidence. Most technologies are pretty bad at those kinds of things, um, especially bad relative to humans. Humans are, you know, one thing we're learning in the pandemic is humans aren't even particularly good at doing that through technology. Um, the ability of Professor Shukla to empathize with you, to support you, to connect you, to build relationships with you um, is you know, for most professors is quite limited here in Zoom school. It's not impossible. And there are faculty who sort of learn how to do these things, you know, but, but, you know, rather before we say, you know, so Ashtush asked the question, how do we solve for that problem? Like the first order question is, should we be working on that problem at all? Um, is that a problem that we should try to solve through technology? Or should we recognize that there are lots of places in which we haven't made a lot of steady progress in doing interesting things with education technology. And let's not try to solve that problem. Let's go back to the areas in which we've had more success and recognize that you know, the most promising systems uh, are gonna have like some limited particular use of technology. I mean, the other thing is, is maybe we use technologies and domains in which that's not a problem that needs to be solved. Um, so for a lot of self-paced online learning, it seems to work really well with people who are highly motivated, who are already educated, um, and uh, who succeed in lots of other places. You know, online learning works really well for the very, you know, most proficient learners that we have. Um, and so one thing we can do is say, great, let's mostly try to serve those folks. Um, 
the problem with that approach is that you end up investing a lot in education technologies that disproportionately benefit the affluent. Um, if you build whole systems that are good at helping, only helping people get their second or third master's degree, um, then you haven't solved a really important problem, which is you know, in a labor market that demands ever greater credentials for folks. Um, how, do we, uh, how do we address that? Good, so here's a bunch more questions. I'll just keep working through these. Um, can we have sustainable globalized tech solutions for education, given that education is quite driven by culture, beliefs, et cetera? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we can. I think that is one of the main errors that technologists have, which is imagining education solutions as universal in their nature. Uh, my colleague, Tressy McMillan Cottom, um, oh, uh, the phrase for this uh, just escaped my mind. But she has this argument that basically um, the idealized learner for a lot of technology developers is like one who basically doesn't exist, um, is just like a, a, like a brain and a set of fingers attached to a keyboard. Um, and you know there are actually people who are kind of like that and they tend to be technology developers. Like, you know, they're like at home in Mumbai or in Boston or in New York or in San Francisco, like they don't really necessarily need to be that close to their families. Um, they, you know, they will like pursue the same leisure activities. They'll like buy the same Ikea furniture in all four of those places and sort of, you know, um, and they're folks who feel really comfortable kind of teaching themselves. Um, but uh, most people are not like that. Um, most people are situated in a particular place in a particular community and that context matters to them enormously. Um, and so, you know, I think part of what we need to think about in education technology is not, and learning at scale is not, how do we build things that could work universally for everyone, but how could we build things that smart, talented local educators could adapt in their local context to meet the particular needs and particular interests of the particular people that we're working with. Um, that is a much harder engineering and design problem, um, but ultimately it may be a, a more interesting one. Um, how do we understand what it is that technology replaces and for whom? What are the current options for different socioeconomic strata? Um, yeah, I, I, I think this notion of like, it's a good place to start when we talk about new technologies, like what is the thing that we're trying to do in some new context? Um, one, of, one of the things that I talk about in, in relation to that question is a problem that I call the curse of the familiar, um, which is that quite a bit of the things that we build um, are meant to digitize existing practices in schools. Um, one of the most widely used pieces of education technology software in the United States, and I think in the world too, is a piece of software called Quizlet. Um, and Quizlet lets you make and practice on online flashcards. Um, part of the success of Quizlet is that, you know, certainly in an American classroom, I assume this is true in an Indian classroom, people use flashcards all the time. And so you don't have to train people how to use flashcards. You don't have to like have some new understanding of flashcards. You just go to this website and you're like, oh, these things are flashcards. I'm gonna like write the questions on one side and the answers on the other and quiz myself and share them with my friends. Um, if we got together a bunch of global education experts and said like, there are some real challenges in the global education system. There are widespread socioeconomic disparities. Um, the, the, the labor market demands for complex cognition are growing. Like, what do we really need to solve this problem? My hunch is, is that nobody would raise their hand and be like, you know what, there's a real dearth of flashcard in schools. We just don't have enough flashcards. There's, you know, people are not memorizing their facts fast enough with flashcards. Um, and yet, here's this tool, which is sort of the most widely adopted, maybe education technology tool in the world. Um, the reason why it can be so widely adopted is that things that are familiar to us are easy for us to take into new systems. By contrast, things that are different are much harder to get into these existing systems. If you were to build an education technology, you're like, I have some really cool ideas about how we could rearrange relationships between teachers and students and have them do new and different kinds of tasks that would lead to better and more interesting learning experiences and learning outcomes for students. When people build stuff like that, one of the most common results is that it confuses everyone. 
They're like, I don't recognize what this thing is. Um, you know, and, and so they either reject it or they take this new thing and they slot it into sort of some existing functionality. So we, we come up with this kind of trap when we think about technology replacing things, you know, if we have it just replacing existing parts of the educational system, that can work from sort of like a product market fit point of view, but it usually doesn't change learning outcomes that much. Um, by contrast, if we build things that's not just about replacing existing opportunities, but by rearranging them, um, then a lot of those things people find confusing and are hard to get work. Um, in the book, I sort of proposed two pathways through the curse of the familiar, one of which you know, is sort of represented a little bit by the figure there on the right, is that you build things that look a little bit like the existing things, but then you find ways over time um, to have the experience of using them be more interesting or more different. So you bring something into schools which looks like an existing practice, but it has the potential to enable lots of new and different kinds of practices. Um, and then I think the other education technology organizations that make the most prog progress in bringing interesting things into schools, they also recognize that it's not a technology adoption problem, it's a community development problem. Um, you have to, if you want tools that enable new pedagogies, new approaches to teaching and learning, you have to complement sharing your technology with building communities of people that are interested in those approaches to teaching and learning. You know, so the two examples that I point to are uh, Desmos and Scratch. So Desmos is this uh, online graphing calculator. Scratch is this programming language and community for computational creativity. And both of those organizations are really interested, not just in spreading their technologies, but spreading a set of pedagogical ideas about how their technologies should work. And they basically have to do this like one country, one district, one school at a time. Um, so Dan Meyer, who's the chief academic officer of Desmos has given talks in all 50 United States. Um, the Scratch team organizes Scratch days in every country in the world practically. Um, and you just build these sort of new understandings kind of one iterative step at a time. Um, it's a, it's, it is a way of thinking about scale, but it's not a way of thinking about scale through dissemination mechanisms. It's a way of thinking about scale the way that we think of political parties coming to scale or social movements coming to scale that you need to sort of bring people together in that way. So the second part of your question um, here, uh, Ankit uh, out on YouTube is, what are options for different socioeconomic strata? And that's sort of too big a question to answer, but we can grapple at part of it, which is to say the intuition behind your question, I think is really good. Um, one of the research questions that's animated almost all of my work um, is how do people from different life circumstances access and experience technology differently? Um, and there are two common stories that we tell about that. Um, the, the most common story from education technology developers is the one on the left, which says that if we create, you know, there's, there's inequality in the world, but if we create new technologies, we will disproportionately benefit um, poor, low income, historically marginalized learners, and we'll see a kind of narrowing of opportunity and achievement gaps. Um, that, as far as I can tell, very rarely, almost never happens. What is far more common is the picture on the right, which is that everyone benefits but people who have more financial, social, and technological capital are better able to take advantage of new innovations. And so new technologies drive accelerating inequality. Um, and there are ways that, you know, I think, I think, you know, the way I present in the book is like, this problem is now like pretty well understood and the research behind it is pretty solid. Um, the, thi you know, the figure on the right happens happens much more frequently than the figure on the left, even by people who are going around saying that their dream is to democratize education. We know some things about the solution space. For all these kinds of dilemmas that I'll propose, we know some general ideas about what better approaches to design might look like, um, but we don't, you know, these, these, these dilemmas that prevent technology from being as useful as they might possibly be, um, they're hard ones to work through. Um, so we know, you know, we, we have some good evidence that it matters um, whether or not you actually measure how people from different backgrounds interact with your learning tools. Um, if you treat every learner like an interchangeable widget, then you're not gonna learn about these differences and if you're attentive to how people from different backgrounds and different life circumstances use your technology. Um, 
One problem we have in technology development is it tends to be uh, only affluent, well-connected elite people who get the resources and power to be able to build their technologies. Um, but the vast majority of people in schools are working class folks who are, who are very socially distant from those elite developers. Um, and so I think some of, the, some of the best work in education technology development asks the question like, how do we reduce the social distance between the people with power to fund and develop things and the people who are actually going to be using things, especially um, our most vulnerable students sort of furthest away from, from opportunity. So those are two of the challenges that uh, um, reference uh, uh, Ankit's uh, good question on YouTube. Um, Professor Kathan, I could uh, take the, the last few minutes to keep talking about these last two questions that are here or we could do something else, or I could be helpful in any other way. Uh, I think we can continue with the presentation. And also, if, if, if we have some time for questions, then we can uh, come at, at the end. Great. Um, well, let me, let me just mention these last two um, uh, dilemmas that I think are quite common as well. So, so again, I think there are sort of four as yet intractable dilemmas. This is how I organize the second half of the book. One of them is the curse of the familiar. One of them is the ed tech Matthew effect. Um, the third one has to do with the unevenness of our technologies. Um, so many online learning environments depend upon assessing student performance. We have to assess student, like even if we don't wanna give people a grade, we have to assess student performance because we have to say, hey, you're doing a little bit better. Here's this harder thing. Or, hey, you're doing a little bit better. You should feel good about yourself. Or, hey, you finished unit one and we know you kind of understand something about it. Move on to the next thing. Um, our assessment technologies are really good in some domains and really lousy in others. Um, probably the most impressive domain that we have automated assessment tools for is in computer programming. Um, I could ask you all to write a computer program that you know, has a certain set of engineering challenges and then I could write a computer program that evaluates how well your computer program meets those engineering challenges. Um, I could, we could evaluate how parsimonious it is, how few lines of code you needed to generate it or few functions or arguments. We could evaluate um, whether or not you sort of met the style guide that would allow people to collaborate. We have some pretty cool tools for grading computer programming. Um, we don't have nearly as good tools for evaluating writing or evaluating reasoning from evidence. Um, and that is, as I mentioned before, like most of what we teach in higher education and K-12 education. And in fact, there's like a pretty close overlap between the things that computers can assess and the things that computers are good at doing. Um, that turns out to be like a, a larger problem in educational systems because it means that like the things that are easiest for us to evaluate are things that we don't need people to do anymore. Um, and the things that we really need people to do in civil society or the things that will really give them a leg up in the labor market, um, complex communication, ill-structured problem solving, uh, we don't have very good automated tools to evaluate human performance in those domains. And so we end up in this weird little trap where the, the things that we're best at assessing may be things that are like not that important to learn. Um, and then finally, I think one challenge um, that, uh, that we have in education is that in, in, in lots of sectors of our society, the way that technology platforms make the most improvements is by subjecting their users to constant experimentation and testing. You know, every time you go to Amazon or your favorite shopping site, you know, or, or not every time, but one tenth of your visits or 1% of your visits, you're being exposed to some kind of new experiment. Someone has changed the font size, someone has changed the flow, someone made the red button blue, um, and they're trying to evaluate whether or not you'll buy something faster or that costs more or whatever else. Um, and as a society, I think we've generally accepted that like that's an okay thing for retailers to do. Um, we tend to not be as happy about that in public education for two reasons. Um, one is we're usually not that keen on the idea of students being forced to be experimental subjects. Um, in the book, I explain why there actually might be some circumstances that we, that we do want people to do that because the alternative is worse. Um, but then the other thing that we really don't like is, you know, like when Amazon collects hordes of data about your every experience on Amazon, like nominally you had a choice to go to that website and you elected to do so and you sort of volunteered your data to them in the process. Um, Maybe it's not a great market arrangement, but, but 
there seems to be some sense of autonomy and reciprocity with it. By contrast, in a lot of cases, we force students to do stuff in schools. Um, particularly in, in primary and secondary schools where education is compulsory, um, it seems kind of creepy to force students to go to school and then say, oh, by the way, when you're at school, you know, Google for education is going to collect hordes of data about your children and you can't opt out of it, um, but you also are forced to go to school and you can't really do school unless you use these tools. Um, so we have some very, you know, the, the most powerful tools that we have for the iterative constant improvement of computational environments. Um, are ones in which there are, I mean, there are moral and ethical dilemmas everywhere in society, but those moral and ethical dilemmas are particularly sharp um, in education. So that's kind of the arguments of the two parts of the book. There are these three genres of education technology. If we know something about them and their history and their legacy of efficacy, we can make good guesses about new things that will come along, that there's a series of challenges that we constantly emerge across these three genres to making technology better. Um, and the heart of many of those challenges is an unwarranted belief um, that technology will sort of sweep away the, uh, the, the, the present and lead to a, a, a bright and different future. Um, and instead, we are better off recognizing that when we develop new tools, they're integrated into communities that already exist um, and that we have to think very seriously about the human needs, the learning needs of all of the different people, the teachers, the administrators, the IT staff, the students, the families in those communities, and that our best chance of making technologies that actually make a difference will be those that bring that sort of holistic systemic perspective. Um, you know, like, like the way to think about this is not as technology disrupting systems, but as technology, you know, in the best possible circumstances, being tools that invite systems to think about how they can improve themselves and do things you know, better and in new ways that they've done before. Uh, so two quick, quick questions. So one is, uh, when is the book going to be available in India? Right. Um, September 29th, they tell okay. me, is the release date. Um, and uh, so that's coming up pretty soon. And then we have this, uh, and you should be, and, and actually like that's the worldwide release date for the ebook too. Um, so failure to disrupt.com, it will link you to what might be sort of America centric booksellers, um, but okay. presumably there are the Harvard University Press can, site can, can help you find other booksellers in other places or you I'm sure can search for those things. And then we do have this uh, virtual book club. If these conversations are interesting to you, um, we're getting together every Monday. It'll be in the middle of the night for you all because it's in my afternoon, but you can get the recordings afterwards and follow along. So register for failure to disrupt.com slash virtual book club um, and, we'll, uh, and we'll have you participate in all those conversations. Yeah. Uh, now I request Professor Vijay Sharijan to express sort of our collective gratitude. Yes, Professor. Well, that's a that's a surprise, Katan. Okay, thank you, Professor Justin Reich. Very interesting. Let me tell you, I enjoyed your lecture a lot. I happen to be chairperson of the Ravi J. Mathai Center for Educational Innovation. Uh, Katan forgot to introduce me, so I'm trying to make up for that lapse. Okay. Very nice. You must be wondering who is this chap who's suddenly butting in. Okay. No, no, no. He seemed very appropriate. You seem to have the command. I can see every all of a sudden sort of in. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> just, <clears throat> I'm not too well, so I can't really talk for long. Let me just, in conclusion, for the benefit of our students attending this course, I reiterate a few points that Justin has made so powerfully. You know, the first point. I'm actually responding to a couple of questions as well. The first question that I would like to respond to is if both instructors and the algorithms depend on Edward Thorndike's approach, would adding one day of computers to four days of classroom make any sense? The answer, think about it this way. You know, when you ask a child to learn herself, it's, it's, it's very different from sitting and you know, learning from a lecturer or a teacher. So there is an element of self-learning that comes in, even if you have just one day along with four days, even though both are based on a similar educational philosophy. 
So that is one point just for you to think about. The second very interesting point that you made, Justin, was about inequalities getting exacerbated through these large-scale tech interventions. In India, and this is for the students, please remember that the language divide is extremely severe, and there is a huge inequality between English, which is the language of power, and which is what most ed tech seems to be targeting, versus the 22 other languages in which our primary education happens. There's hardly anything in those 22 languages. So what the point you made, Justin, extremely relevant. We have seen this in India. Educational inequalities get exacerbated, no doubt about it. Our own studies show that. But there is a language dimension, which our young people, the developers, and many of the ed tech companies uh, do not seem to be putting in as much effort as you know, I would have loved to see them do. You know, the, most of the focus is on English. So that is contributing to a huge social divide as well. So that is the second point. The third point, very briefly, is on the large scale metrics that you mentioned. You know that, remember many of the programs that we see in India have very clear stated aims. And these aims, give us a guide to the kinds of metrics that can be used. Just to give you an example, we tried out, a, we actually collaborated on a huge smart class effort in a local language, not English. And the stated aims of that program were you know, stated to be two kinds of outcomes expected, a set of cognitive outcomes and a set of non-cognitive outcomes. So the metrics that we used to assess that very large scale program was a set of these two out metrics. Now, the point that you made about non-cognitive outcomes being extremely difficult to measure. You know, you really don't have ways of measuring reasoning ability or comprehension ability. So that we had to do with a combination of video through a mobile, you know, reaching out, asking them to submit and somebody does the evaluation. So there are ways of addressing that. But remember, when you look at assessing many of these non-cognitive competencies, our technology is just not well equipped to do an assessment, even if you know what the metrics are. I would know what the metrics are, but measurement is certainly a problem. So we've tried to tackle that in different ways, but a lot more quality work needs to go into that. Finally, the point about integration that you made that to, to at least to the Ravi Matai Center, that is extremely important. Ultimately uh, disrupting, disrupting what you might ask. And your answer, Justin, was, you know, let systems learn from technology. Let technology help systems, you know, improve, improve. And in India, the crucial, the most crucial point is the 50%, 60% of our children who do not attend English medium schools. Now that is where the real problem is. And somehow we are averse in spite of having extremely comprehensive policies and a lot of money going in, somehow the language divide has not been addressed. So integrating technology with teaching, with the schools, with communities and society, as you mentioned, that is the key challenge for us. And not to look technology as a magic bullet, you know, which is going to take care of the learning crisis that we have today. Now, this is just in conclusion. Once again, I, before handing it back to Katan, I would thank you, Justin. Extreme, uh, extremely interesting one hour we spent here. Certainly not wasted. <laughs> you know, very, very exciting and interesting to listen to you. And let's be in touch. I hope. Yeah, thanks, Professor Sean. Can be in touch with you. Very, a very thoughtful analysis and a very, you know, important set of considerations of how take these ideas that I'm sitting in North America thinking about and and apply them to this your own context. I think very, very helpful. Thank you. Back to you, Katan. Yeah, just uh, wanted to express that uh, whenever this pandemic is over. So Justin, we need to have you come down to IIM Ahmedabad. 
uh, it would be great to have you uh, here as well. Uh, but again, once again, thank you so much for uh, spending this your ideas with us. And this 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 one hour has been really precious for us. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Take care, everybody. Best wishes. Stay safe. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll catch up later. Yeah. Thank you, sir.